was asked I think the question that was asked of us today was to personalize some of what you heard this morning and to put it into um, kind of the terms of the entrepreneur as opposed to the theory. And I can say by um, having lost a few, um, there is an aspect uh, to all of this that uh, you continually get up and ask yourself in the morning, what is it that I'm really doing? And I think these days more than ever, on the history of the planet are demanding each of us uh, get up in the morning and see how much we can contribute. I wanted to share with you um, a few stories about uh, just starting things and leaving things and perhaps leave you with a few um, items to ponder in your own enterprises, whether you go into the corporate uh, world or whether you start your own. And first of all, there's been a lot of discussion about do we support big companies? You know, is entrepreneurialism the future? And I really believe that all of those questions, um, the time is such that we need to begin uh, beyond that and look at what the whole world needs to do uh, and how we can do that together. And I believe enterprises should be looked at as communities. Uh, networks should be looked at as movements and we need to pull those things together into a new social fabric that we can all look back and, and say to our children that we did give them some pathways. Um, and I have an 18 year old who's applying uh, to school this year and I certainly know that he's looking at a different future. And from the dinner table conversations that we have every day, I'm still not so sure that the one uh, we've left him is the same one that I was hearing about um, when I was on my way to college, which was, you know, we've just landed a man on the moon, um, you know, we can do anything, and uh, there's such a bright future ahead of those that have the privileges. Um, the privileges that are present in this room are privileges that far exceed, uh, I think, almost any room I can imagine, and I include the UN. I think that the world is looking at business to provide leadership. The world is looking at youth uh, to solve the problems because our generation hasn't given itself enough time to solve those problems. And I, I want to challenge all of you in this room to uh, think about how to make it the vision that you collectively um, weave with each other to make that vision a reality right away. I started Odwalla in 1980 uh, when the natural foods movement was pretty much, um, I don't want to say a gleam in somebody's eye, but um, it was less than $4 billion in a, a, as a roll-up. Um, we, we were a group of people that were absolutely passionate about what we were doing. And I don't think at that time there had been any acquisitions that I can think of, even Airwine, which is one of the first retailers. Um, and the world was a landscape of basically improvisation and passion. Um, over the years, I think Gary and I, um, of any of the entrepreneurs we started up, have started with, have developed an appreciation for taking those inclinations and those principles and combining them with systems and combining them with infrastructure. And uh, that balance, um, which is more than passion and, and more than entrepreneurial courage, it's something that I think um, the MBA programs are uniquely suited to train you for. And this type of, um, I don't know, it's, it's a form of warriorship, although I don't like the military metaphor, or I wanted to say about the in the trenches thing. Um, one of the jobs of this century is to, I believe, feminize business and it feminized it in the sense that it becomes more nurturing, um, more inclusive, and more of a community-based enterprise in which we look at helping each other instead of um, trying to be first. Uh, capital. Uh, uh, capital. Um, when we started in, in the 80s, um, we were really suspicious of capital. Uh, as I stand here in front of you today, 
I remain deeply suspicious of capital. Uh, However, um, let me say that uh, I would invite all of you in this room to blow up your own notions of capital. I think this century is bringing forms of capital valuation based on creative capital, intellectual capital, social capital, and community capital that are making ways of making businesses and enterprises both less corruptible and more answerable to the constituencies and the environments in which they live. Um, I was inspired because I think I owe you an explanation while at 51 years old, uh, I decided to go back into the juice business, compete with my alma mater, and um, basically made myself kind of miserable again. Um, getting up early in the morning does require something that I think at this age when when you have the security of, of resources that you didn't have when you were 25, um, that requires a story that you tell yourself. And the story that I heard that got me back in the juice business um, was a young woman from Senegal who came up to me after a talk like this and said, could I get, Greg, I, could I get, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to ask you a few questions about uh, a juice company that I'd like to start? And um, I really, you know, I really, for one, truthfully never wanted to get back into the juice business. So I, I reluctantly said, well, yeah, okay, you know, just, I'm really not interested in being on any board, uh, but sure, okay, let's have a conversation. So Gatway, who was at that time 26 or 27 years old, um, explained to me that in her homeland of Senegal, um, there had been a four or five year period in which she was away from uh, Africa. She went to France and went to business school and came back. And when she returned during that four or five year period, virtually all of the indigenous beverages that used to be a daily part of the diet, including the national beverage of Senegal, which is a hibiscus drink, uh, were gone. And by gone, meaning um, when you would go to somebody's house, you would no longer be served uh, the tradition of hospitality, which is a plate uh, of hibiscus tea, you know, in a certain cup, and that was a symbol of um, of thankfulness and, and respect. Now, for a thousands of year old culture to shift in four or five years and be replaced by products that have absolutely no relationship to the agricultural base um, and the traditions of a culture, uh, I think that there, there's something that could, um, could, could handle some improvement. So um, I said, okay, you know, this sounds like uh, something worth uh fighting for again and um, I asked her what her plan was and she said well unfortunately I'm a realist because I know that Africans uh, will not accept new brands unless they're from the West so what I want to do is create a brand that's so popular in America that by the time it comes back to Africa it will be embraced by my own people and uh, there's the kind of and um, there was a kind of perverse logic to it uh, that I felt, um, okay, reverse colonialism and, you know, maybe get it right the second time. But in the meantime, um, we were able to set up uh, some women's cooperatives to supply our first shipments of hibiscus. Uh, we had an opportunity, it was my first trip to Africa, uh, to set up a supply chain in which we, we knew we could guarantee a transparency transparency and a, uh, a more than fair wage that was paid directly to the women. And out of that experience, um, I came back here and thought about what I saw them going through, walking three to four kilometers every morning to go and pick the hibiscus and then back to their homes. And we called them and said, what can we do to help you with your, you know, your daily life? And um, what they asked us for was a couple of uh, carts and buggies uh, with horses. 
and we said, well, we'd be happy to, you know, help you do that, but um, we can get a Toyota truck for you, and I mean, we can really make this a lot easier. And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. Don't, don't give us a truck, because tomorrow the men will have the truck. And I said, well, what do you mean the men will have the truck? Well, I mean, the men like trucks, and um, they don't care how we're making the money. In fact, you know, the truth is that the cultural structures prevent, um, prevent the women from economic democracy in ways that we would take for granted over here. And the lesson learned there is that when we think about concepts that we hear in speeches and, and that we get involved with here, uh, we tend to think about helping. And helping is many times more about getting involved and participating uh, all the way back to what's really happening. And this is what I learned is that um, you know, all well-meaning aside, when you really want to do well, it's more about having the, the authenticity of the relationship than being able to talk about concepts like fair trade. And um, I believe with this product is certainly, um, I think the next um, ambition and goal for myself to try to make these ideas part of the popular culture and move them out from uh, coffee and chocolate where um, the concept of who makes it and is it fair and how does our success reside that we make, you know, in the West and when we make markets um, and who's the beneficiary of that success. So with cult cultural appropriations as something that all of us uh, need to be concerned about, um, we partnered and um, I'm happy to say that Adina uh, is a company that has a majority ownership by women. Um, it has the largest shareholder as an African and it's uh, a new form of capitalization um, that I think takes these ideas like fair trade to another level and it really takes the level of cultural understanding uh, to another level. And I think that can be done in our inner cities as well. And we'd like to encourage all of you to think about how to do that closer to home. Um, I talked a little bit about other forms of capital and I wanted to just mention uh, and encourage all of you. Uh, I gave a talk at Berkeley um, about different forms of corporate organizations. And this is something that I think there's a lot of opportunity for your generation to make uh, a net impact on. And that is when you form um, ideas about changing the world and when you form ideas about how to make a difference, there is a lot of creativity and a lot of room within our legal structure to create entities in which um, the fruits of your labors can be more equitably distributed. And I think we have a lot to learn, and certainly I've started to learn this from the Africans, um, that sharing with the village um, is sometimes uh, harder to do than we think. And there are structures such as co-ops, which allow for for-profit enterprises um, to flourish and distribute and actually make a broader ecosystem of beneficiaries. Um, and I've been a part of a, a group in California that wants to transform California agriculture to at least 50% organic in the next 50 years. And that group is looking at how to bring supply chain partners together and how to form other entities, both of capitalization and of ownership, which link the consumer, the producer, and the, the supplier or, or, or the agricultural source together in mutualism, which is what the original companies in the United States were formed for. In fact, the origin of all the insurance companies are mutuals. And this concept is something that I want to leave you with because I think that um, the corporations of the future, and by corporations, I mean enterprise structures, are full of ways of solving these problems and including ownership and, and diversifying ownership. Um, in capitalizing Adena, um, we decided to form a community of investors and not go to venture capital organizations, but instead to go upstream to the members and individual 
owners of venture capital firms and asked them to make investments as individuals. And we found that on a more personal level that you can get the Karitsu effect by building, you know, networks of people that become equally passionate as the entrepreneurs. And I want to encourage you to think about maybe how you can do that with some of your own enterprises. Um, I've also been working with a project that was founded by D. Hawk, um, who is the, um, the former chair and, and um, founder of Visa. And D wanted to share with another generation the um, organizational concepts that made Visa successful. And we first tried to tackle this with nonprofits, and I, I think really learned a hard lesson is that you can't export these ideas um, directly into uh, new forms of for profit organization uh, as easily as we thought. But what we did uncover is ways of looking at this concept of mutualism from the point of view of what nature does or biomimicry. And when you look at a tree, um, let's take a redwood tree, the root system and belief system of the tree is connected by the trunk and all of the, um, the ability, the miraculous ability to go backwards with liquid uh, against gravity. Um, when you actually analyze what happens with a redwood tree, the redwood tree is able to put nutrients and water back into the soil. And it does that by having so many um, areas of interface with the fog and, and the cool weather that it literally sucks moisture out of the air and distributes it in and, and forms its own ecosystem pumping water into the soil. So I thought that was a, a great image um, to leave you with and to think about if we can make corporations that do that in the next 20 years, because as I'm sure Al mentioned, the urgency um, of the environment that we all live in requires that level of inspiration and that level of actual um, commitment and execution for all of us to do with each enterprise so that we become solutions. Um, I want to leave you with that image of the, tree, um, the, the mighty tree. And I, 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 I know it's not an oak tree, so I didn't want to attach it too close to Stanford here, but I have spent a lot of um, very pleasurable times in the Redwood, and I feel like uh, between our second generations of entrepreneurs that have had natural products, sustainability, and community enterprises at the heart of what makes you tick and get up in the morning, I hope that all of you can be inspired to change the world. Um, I know we didn't get there, so I'd like to offer any intergenerational partnership that we can put forward. I'm open to interns any month of the year, so please get back to me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. I think Greg is one of the most wonderful people I know, and I always love to hear him. I'm, I'm going to pick up on that sense of urgency and um, also take a cue from uh, Al uh, Gore from this morning. Um, uh, when I think about uh, business, the business environment interface, I'm reminded of my favorite philosopher, Lily Tomlin, who says uh, no matter how cynical I get, it's hard to keep up. And uh, I know after this morning's uh, remarks that I don't have to preach to you about the negative impact that business and commerce have had on the planet and on the hopes for future generations. In our ignorance and in our arrogance, we've applied a kind of a linear um, exploitative model in which we input the planet's resources at one end and output concentrations of capital, but also waste. And we've engaged in this mythology with these several fundamental and flawed beliefs, and Greg just spoke to some of them. One, that we can continue to mine and toxify the Earth's crust without long-term 
repercussions for future life. Uh, two, that technology and ingenuity can replace na natural order. Three, that we can heat our planet and convert fixed carbon into gaseous carbon and send it away. And fourth, that there is even an idea of something called away, uh, which, you know, my generation, uh, wastewater engineers who grew up in money, uh, you know, learned that the solution to pollution is dilution. And uh, I, I now say that, that that's a delusion. Uh, now, I'm no Luddite, and I believe in technology, and in fact, many of the strides that we natural products companies have enjoyed have been very much due to technology, just as I believe in the power of capitalism and commerce for to be constructive forces for positive change. But I think we need to shed these myths, as you've now heard several of us say, and forge a new model of capitalism and a new set of principles. And so what I want to do now is just talk to you about my last 23 years. We started, um, like Greg, we started uh, early in the natural, the, the natural products movement. I always say that uh, we were uh, producing organic yogurt back when yogurt, or back when organic used to mean that you have to chew extra. And I think uh, a lot of the older folks here know what I'm talking about. We had these wonderful breads and, you know, delicious uh, foods, pastas that you could kind of work your way through. We had, it, it was all, uh, you know, eating with our brains, not with our mouths. But somewhere along the way, we discovered and realized that it was food and it needed to taste delicious. And uh, that has, I think, been a big contributor to our explosion. But I think there's been another a big contributor and and uh, it, it for me began as a hypothesis 23 years ago and it's now absolutely proven theorem in fact al and i uh, spent an hour together after uh, backstage here afterwards and uh, uh you know the, these are the theorems that i think um, his organization is trying to absolutely put to work in their investment decisions and and, and, and i think he's going to do incredibly well my generation used to talk about sustainability and slowing things down. And yet now we're speaking about survivability and getting back down. And I will cut to the punchline and just simply say to you that uh, I know, I know now that we can build businesses that return strong shareholder value while at the same time invest in restoration. Uh, and along the way, uh, in our, in my odyssey, what began as a hypothesis, you know, um, you know we had many, many, many rough years of, of very steep learning. I, I don't know if you've heard the Winston Churchill quote that success, success is the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, I think we're both sort of pathological optimists here. And yes, we are from the generation that didn't exhale, unlike uh, um, Al Gore's ex and former partner. But um, but I I'm learning uh, that in fact uh, this theorem, uh, what what got us through all of this, what got us to this scale that we're at as an industry and in my own business in particular, uh, is in fact the very mission that caused me to go there in the first place. And I'll try to make that case for you very briefly here. I should also say that I'm learning now in my new relationship with Gupta Nan that this, which I'll speak about, that this, this can be true, this rule, this idea that the mission is actually a, 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 a core of our top and bottom line success and our longevity uh, is, is even more true in the largest corporations out there. Now, Stonyfield's approach is just one, and we've, we're fortunately seeing many, many others. But I can tell you that... Um, well, let me just cut through and just uh, give you some anecdotes, and then maybe we can discuss this in the uh, Q&A. So just to put the parameters up there, Stonefield is now the third largest yoga company in America. We have 350 employees. We'll do 210 million in sales. We'll produce about 25 million in a net profit. Uh, we grew 28% in the last year, but over the last 13 years, we've grown at an average ca uh, compound growth rate of about 23% in a category that is growing at about 6 to 7% annually, so three or four times the category. Um, we are not only the number three yogurt brand in the country, we're the number one organic brand in the world, and now we've actually started a new company called Stonyfield Europe, which is launching in Ireland and England and France and uh, actually Turkey, where, by the way, the average herd size is 1.2 cows. Um, my roots, uh, not unlike a lot of uh, my peers, were actually in the nonprofit uh, world. I ran a little place called New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, where we did ecological design and, and advanced a lot of the things that are now becoming part and parcel of the modern-day science. I was actually a windmill builder myself. 
Um, and we could, in an area of about a quarter of the size of the stage, we could feed 10 people three meals a day, 365 days a year using no fossil fuels, no, no chemical pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers, using only the sun as our engine. And uh, we could feed uh, folks profitably. You could come in the winter with five feet of snow outside and see bananas and figs, all papayas growing, all solar uh, powered. Um, the, the fish water was a waste food system that was turned into a food system for the gardens, and the gardens were a, food, a waste system that would produce food for the um, tanks, and the tanks were heating the building by trapping the sun's rays and so forth. And as I think some of you may have heard as I've toured around telling this story, I visited my mother in 1980 at the, um, uh, at the Epcot Center in Florida, where they had the, la the land pavilion funded at that time by Kraft Foods. And as you can probably imagine, it was a little bit different than my model or my notion of how food would be grown in the future. Um, the sort of punchline was you buy the Velveeta and leave the food growing to us. It was a, a monument to uh, fossil fuel use, to mining the Earth's crust. It was a heated building in Central Florida. There were huge amounts of uh, fossil fuels uh, going in and, and pesticides and fertilizers and so on and so forth. And as horrified as I was by the model of how food would be grown in the future, I was even more horrified by the fact that for the 25,000 people who visited my institute every year, that's how many people paid to go through there every day. And I uh, came out of the booth, uh, out of the uh, pavilion, and I said to my mother, Mom, I've got to become Kraft Foods. I, to have that power, that reach, is, is, is what I, uh, I, I need if I'm going to advance this notion of a more sustainable agriculture. Um, as again, some of you know, four years ago, we passed Kraft in sales of yogurt. We're now actually three times their size. Their Briars brand. And so 21 years after that epiphany, I actually entered into a partnership with Group Danone, which is a $18 billion global uh, dairy company. The mission that led us, that we took off with, was uh, a five part mission of superior quality, of using, of uh, seeing education as marketing, marketing as education, of enriching, or providing an enriched workplace where people could advance their career goals of saving family farmers, but primarily and most importantly, proving that we could do an, have a, a focus on our ecological footprint, while at the same time concentrating on maximizing profitability. Because it was my belief that even if we could make a successful company, and it took us many years to get there, uh, that uh, we would only be one successful company, that the planet, for all the reasons Greg and Al talked about, could not wait around for us to just be, become one large company. We needed to inspire other large companies, and the only way we were going to do that was by showing that you could get a tremendous bottom line. And if you, if you have the focus on profitability, you realize, of course, there's really only two ways to do it. You can grow revenues or you can cut costs and or even cut costs. So some examples of what we've learned over these years. On cost cutting, we, we, we were the first manufacturer in the country to make ourselves a zero uh, emissions manufacturer, that is to say, a non-contributor to climate change. And we did that by changing the lighting, by taking the heat out of our wastewater, by double insulating our coolers and so on, and taking the savings that we were generating. And by the way, this is in the millions of dollars per year. Uh, many, many thousands of tons of CO2 that were being taken out of the atmosphere. But obviously, the best way to, to use energy, to, to, to save energy is to, is to not use it in the first place. Um, and we used some of the portion of those millions of dollars to invest in trees, planting trees, or converting diesel buses over to natural gas buses. In other words, into something that you, many of you know, called carbon offsets. On waste prevention and recycling, over these last 10 years, we prevented 12 million pounds of materials from going to landfill or incinerators, that's 7,000 tons of CO2. About 70% of our waste that goes out goes out as recyclables. Interestingly, we've turned it up. Not only has that reduced our cost because we don't have disposal and landfill costs, landfill costs but we've also been able to uh, take waste products and turn them into our revenue. For example, the cardboard boxes that, deliver, that come delivering our packaging, we fold those and we sell them to a company called Rebox, who actually pays us to use them and they reuse them as boxes. Uh, we've saved uh, over a million dollars dollars uh, a year from um, decreased trash hauling, increased revenues from recyclables, and so on. Our packaging and, and, and moving, getting rid of the overcap that you might have seen if some of you ate our yogurt a few years ago, and we're replacing it with a foil lid. We're using 16% less energy, 13% less water, 6% less solid waste, saving about a million dollars a year. 
uh, and obviously uh, that also includes uh, less waste stream uh, or the form fill and seal machines that, that now where we actually fill it on the line it saves us 1.8 million dollars annually uh, i call this the first national bank of conservation this has been my my venture capital uh, one last example organic sugar in, in brazil where we purchased our uh, sugar from 30,000 acres of uh, cooperatively farmed uh, cropland down there uh, our investment in organics has resulted in our farmers but and by the way the sugar uh, that we were buying five years ago was a 100 percent premium the organics are 100 percent more expensive than conventional uh, so yes we are all crazy people up here um but but what has happened is the investment in organics has resulted in an investment in, in really the earth's equity by putting compost and manures and chopped cane back into the soil we've actually increased soil till we built equity we have 50 species of birds and mammals that have returned to these areas the soil takes much less energy and effort to till it up it's much more mo moisture holding uh, the conventional farms sugar farms right next to us uh, which have been a, uh, there's been a drought the last couple of um, uh, summer our uh, winters uh, our winters their summers uh, the, with a lack of organic matter in the soil when you spray water on it it just evapotranspirates and it transpires and they lose maybe 90 percent of the water but in organic soils and we've seen this in the central valley right here in california i've walked in central valley dairy farms that are organic where there are birds and bees flying all over and i've gone a half a mile down the road where there's no life there's nothing happening because the entire food chain has been disrupted but what has happened here is that these soils retain moisture keep more active uh, uh, microbiological uh, activity and, and and also are obviously uh, getting greater yields the dairy the, the sugar farmers in brazil now have had 10 percent annual increases in yields we're now at parity with conventional and my and in terms of pricing and i've actually now got uh, about a 25 percent reduction in cost by investing in the plant Hundreds of organic dairy farms in New England and across the country have found the same thing, that they're more profitable than ever in coming back uh, due to cost reductions. Animals live longer. Uh, their soil takes less energy and horsepower to till up and so forth. So on the revenue generation side of the model, uh, again, in our model of capitalism, uh, we have uh, a disadvantage. And I, I guess I'll use the metaphor of Coke and Pepsi here uh, with you, one of the sponsors. Um, you know, Coke and Pepsi's mission, which is the mission of most consumer products, is to cheapen the product as much as you possibly can. And there's really nothing cheaper than sugar, water, and corn syrup solids. Um, and then you take this enormous margin that's left over and you buy advertising. And as I think we're all learning, and certainly you all are, are learning, advertising is less and less uh, effective uh, all, the, all the while. We're now being over-messaged as a society. You can get your messages on your Blackberry and your cell phone and... And uh, we're, you know, we're all constantly plugged in, and we're just less responsive to them. Um, now, as an organic company and, and uh, as a natural products company, we have we don't have that luxury of cheapening our product because our, our whole mission is to reinvest in farmers, reinvest in the earth, reinvest in in long-term true natural equity. And so the net result of that is we've had to just be a lot more clever. When Al was talking today in his fund, how the the, the the fund managers uh, were saying that this is a, uh, I mean, the the, the uh, the ecotypes are saying this is so cool to be engaged in investment because the discipline of the marketplace is is uh, is uh, really helps to get uh, very focused on what needs to, needs to happen. That has absolutely been the story for our company and ever so many natural products companies. We've just had to find another way, a non-advertising way, to make up that net margin. So I can tell you, at my gross margin line, I'm 10 points beyond behind my peers, but I make it all up below the, below the line where my nets are exactly the same as them by just simply focusing on other things we do. So we use our lids, our packaging, to talk about environmental messages. We have 150 million lids. Al will never uh, forgive me for the fact that when he was heading up to Kyoto, and we weren't sure, we, the environmental community wasn't exactly sure whether he was going to sign the Global Warming Accord, we published his email address on our lids, and uh, he got something He got something like 175,000 emails. Uh, now, I sent 174,000 myself, but, um, but now Nevertheless, another thousand people joined me um, when the Gingrich Congress was coming in with, well, some of you may not remember, but they, they had what I called the contract on America. Uh, they were threatening to slash funding for clean air and clean water. We came out with a lid that said, Congress, have you flipped your lid? And then you flip it over, and there was a letter that you could write, and it said, Dear Congressperson, you could fill in their name. It said, I believe in an efficient government, but not at the expense of my children's futures. If you vote against the planet, I won't vote for you. And 
15,000 people nailed these lids into Capitol Hill. Um, when we were going into uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago was basically a two supermarket town when we started, and the two supermarkets told us we had to get to a 3.5 market share uh, within three months, or we wouldn't be able to stay on the shelf. Now, that, by our estimate, was around $11 million of advertising spend, which we, of course, didn't have. So uh, we called the train. Uh, my background is climate change. I know that when you take a train or a bus, you're saving 45 pounds of particulate from going into the atmosphere per year by not driving your consumer, your commuter vehicle. So we went to the Chicago Transit Authority and said, folks, will you let us um, go on your train platforms and hand out yogurt to thank people for riding the trains? And they were sort of stunned by this. They said, you want to thank us for uh, thank them for riding our train? They said, sure. They had never allowed food on their platforms in the entire history of the program. Uh, so we greeted 85,000 commuters in three days, gave them a yogurt, a spoon, a little memo, that, a little brochure that said, we salute your commute. Thank you for doing your part to fight climate change. Of course, these poor commuters just thought they were getting to work. Uh, uh, the Today Show came down. Uh, we had uh, all kinds of news. People were saying these crazy people are uh, giving out yogurt to thank people for riding trains. At the end of the week, we were 3.1 market share with 85,000 samples uh, uh, and save, uh, savings of about $10 million if you uh, went the conventional route. So inspired by this, we went to Texas, where, of course, they don't believe in trains. And, um, and, uh, and uh, this is right in the heart of Bush country. Uh, and uh, we came up with this little statistic that if our if America kept our car tires properly inflated, we could get a 2 MPG increase in national cafe standards and national fuel efficiency. So we made up a big giant sign. We stood on the side of the road that we support inflation. And um, people would pull off the side of the road. We'd hand them a, uh, we'd fill their tires with air. We'd hand them a little tire gauge with the Stonyfield logo, a coupon, a yogurt, a brochure. And same thing, dumped our share immensely. The, the classic example of uh, living without advertising for us has always been our house. A cow program. Back when we were completely impoverished in the early days, um, and all we had was cows, and uh, so we decided to put them up for adoption. And you could send in um, five lids, you get yourself a photograph of your cow, a certificate uh, of uh, naming you the co-owner of the cow, and then a, your cow would send you letters twice a year. So, and the, the net of all of this, and just to just to cut to the cut to the punchline is that we've, we've built a, a, a relationship with our consumer that is ultimately the holy grail of what advertising intends, which is through focusing on sustainability, through focusing on our mission, we have built loyalty, which is the holy grail. Now, let me just simply say in closing uh, here so we can go to the Q&A that uh, my deal with Group Danon, the same, same situation. Here I'm faced, I've had this wonderful run of success, huge uh, growth on the top and bottom line, tremendous uh, results. Danon came, that, that what it ended up doing is in addition to this whole notion of sustainability and building sustainability into our business, um, being key to our top and bottom line growth, it's also been key to my remaining independent. Danon has purchased 80% of the company, and yet I still control three of five board seats. They have only vetoes on CapEx and acquisitions. Uh, I've delivered, as long as I deliver my numbers, I've delivered 250% growth since they came in on the top line, 500% growth on the bottom line, and so forth. So to, to conclude, and, and, and let me just say that the chairman of Danon, an $18 billion company who, like Nestle and so many of these other companies, wants to enter the space, said that Stonyfield represents an ethic that, Danone, that we at Danon must adopt if we're going to be successful in the next century. That ethic and this mission can be summarized very simply. When I went to Harvard Graduate School for my nephew's graduation uh, last June, I listened to Jeffrey Emmelt, and I'm a big fan of what he's starting to do at GE, but I must beg to differ when I heard heard him talk about the party line, which is the primacy of the shareholder. I would leave you with this thought that I believe in the primacy of the shareholder as long as it is equal and equitable with the rights of farmers, the rights of employees, the rights of the community, the rights of the planet. And my key learnings in these 23 years, which I'm happy to discuss with you now, is that essentially the conscious consumption Consumer is still in charge. Tell the consumer what you stand for. Tell them what you believe in. Walk your talk. Do the things that we say that we want to see in the world. And, uh, and, 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 and therefore prove the power of the Margaret Mead's adage, which is never doubt the power of one to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. Thank you.
most provocative. I have a lot of questions, but let me go for one. I noticed in your bios, you're both members of, or formerly members of Social Venture Network, SVN. And can I ask, do you have an MBA? No. And do you have an MBA? Okay, so this is a great question. I just had the honor and privilege of speaking at my very first and potentially very last SVN conference two weeks ago in Tucson, Arizona. And I was simply there to talk about what we're doing in business schools today to train future business leaders. And I was on a panel with a man named Gifford Pinchot, who has started the Bainbridge Graduate Institute. And we spoke for a lot of time about what we're doing, and I talked about what we're doing at Haas. He talked about what's happening at Bainbridge. And the first person who raised his hand said, Kelly, this question is directed at you. You asked what you could do to produce better MBA graduates. And he paused for just a very quick moment, and then he said, I would never hire an MBA. I never have hired an MBA. And I hope never again in my life to see an MBA in the business world. That's encouraging, isn't it? Oh, it gets better. Do you think my nose is still a little bruised? Um, he said, there are three things you could do to train better MBA graduates in our world. You could teach them humbleness because their egos are immense. You could teach them comfort with stylistic diversity, people who are different from them. And you could teach them a sense of urgency because the world is far too big to up. Um, and they don't get it. How, I would imagine, I hope Benny Bridge is here, and I hope the City or World College is here, which are two, uh, two new MBAs. But in my simplistic way of thinking, I'm not certain a Stanford MBA, a Berkeley MBA, a Harvard MBA, a Yale MBA is ever going to go away in my lifetime. So you're sitting in the audience, probably majority of mainstream MBA programs. What would you say to mainstream MBA students? Uh, well, uh, I, the first thing I would say is that you all uh, give me hope. You represent the... Uh, exactly uh, the future that we want to create. You understand integration. That's why you're sitting here patiently listening through these these, these speakers. Um, our mit, you know, if we take seriously what we've spoken about here, what Greg talked about and what Al talked about earlier, then we realize, then we realize I think, very quickly and logically that our mission cannot just be to start up new enterprises that are going to... Um, I mean, that's certainly part of the mix. We have to take over the ones that exist now. They're not going away either. Um, my mission at Tanan is very simple. Uh, I was thrilled that they gave my shareholders an excellent exit and a wonderful return. They left me totally independent. But if Danan goes organic, then Nestle, Kraft, and Unilever will have to follow. Now, these companies are loaded with MBAs. Uh, these folks only hire folks with the letters after the name. The, 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 the systems that you all have been, the disciplines that you all are in the process of learning and the, the calculus that you're making in your own career choices um, has to recognize your immense value to these folks because you are ambassadors from a place that they need to get to. There is not an oncologist, a pediatrician, gynecologist, GP in this country who isn't recognizing the health problems that are resulting from decades of inattention to what goes into our body. There's not a scientist out there who doesn't accept that climate change is a reality. That is our lack of attention to what goes into the planet. The problem is that they don't have necessarily out of the scientists, and I come out of the scientists, the business disciplines, the management disciplines to get us there. Um, they're not, all of these companies are racing to get into organic now. Uh, the problem is they don't quite know how to do it. They're looking to be efficient, they're looking to be quick, and they're going to be looking to you. So I would say, au contraire, this is the future. And I appreciate you all for and the courage that the, and, and, and the vision that you've got in, in, in coming together with this incredible organization. Greg, would you hire an MBA? Um, I'd like to narrow it down to JD MBA as possible. Carl Rove made a comment today. He said, we're facing an era of um, judicial imperialism. And uh, I beg to differ, so I hope there's some of you out there who want to stick up for the judicial branch and um, can also 
think like a business person. Um, Gary and I actually had a lot of statements or a lot of uh, conversations with each other about um, this issue in the early days when we were building our companies. And um, I've had great experiences and I've had some, um, let's say, cultural um, miscommunications um, when um, MBAs were hired without, I would say, a full uh, integration with the core values of the company. And I think um, we've passed that period already. I think the issues that Gary brought up about urgency, overwhelm, any kind of uh, poor dialectic, you know, I think we need uh, to, to take a page out of Gary's tricks like flipping the lid. I think we need more intelligent design in our companies. Um, I wish we could reclaim that word. Um, the, uh, the you know, the backgrounds, I, 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 hope, I don't know if Gifford is here. Is he by any chance? Um, I, I just want to uh, pay an homage to Gifford because um, uh, Gifford uh, really wanted to set the bar higher, not because he felt that, you know, there was anything wrong with MBAs in general. It was out of honoring that discipline. And I think they want to try to have as much impact and interrelationship with the uh, regular school MBAs. And I think anything that can introduce both discipline and higher standards around intelligent design is what we all need to do. So let's just get on with it. So Al Gore ended by challenging everybody in this room to confront their own collisions every day in business and to fiercely protect or guard and stand up for your own values every day because the other side is going to fight back and fight back fiercely. You're a CEO, you're a CEO. These students aren't going to graduate and become the first day of CEO or CEO, although they might. I have a sense that when they go into their first day of their job as a manager or senior manager or project manager, that can feel a little bit frightening to stand up and fight your battles and face the collision every day. What would you tell them as a senior manager, a manager, a product manager, brand manager? Well, I think your job's being made a lot easier by uh, gas prices right now. Uh, you know, conservation, the things that you take for granted that your predecessors didn't, the solutions uh, are the solutions. You're expediting the learning curve here. Um, you know, uh, I could have, I could talk for hours about the. the Anecdotally, tangibly, about the examples of how applying sustainability principles have saved uh, companies, have saved these brands, given them USP, built customer loyalty, cut costs, helped recruitment and retention. Uh, put forth, I would probably put forth your net impact credentials at the front of what you're doing, and I would I would aggressively look for internship opportunities. Uh, in your in between, you know, in your summer, uh, those of you who are first years, uh, to get yourselves, get your teeth cut in these environments. Because I, I can tell you that these companies, and I'm not speaking in the consumer space, but I, I see it in the energy space. These companies are desperate. They, they see what's going on. They, they're desperate for these solutions. And again, uh, there's, a, there's plenty of examples. Walter Robb is here from Whole Foods. Whole Foods is changing the nature of the grocery industry. Pity the average grocer out there who's got Walmart on the one hand, the low cost, and Whole Foods on the other. They can't, if they're not either one, they're going to lose. They're going to get squeezed from the middle. Whole Foods represents a value system, a value proposition that clearly is price unconscious. And I think your, your absorption and understanding of these anecdotes will actually make you an asset. And I would be very bold when you first get there. I think it's a different world uh, completely than when we were getting started, and I wanted to pick up on the internship thing because I do think there is a difference in a corporate atmosphere than a, uh, either a startup or a small entrepreneurial company. And, uh, in internships, uh, it used to be, well, you went out and, you know, you want to get your first job or, you know, you're going to work for Bain or one of the big consulting companies. But the amount that you can learn because the um, ability to make a difference in a small company 
and the ability to get actually the whole picture um, and get some hands-on experience is uh, unparalleled. When you're in the corporate um, atmosphere, particularly coming out of school, you're going to have to, by necessity, take a smaller piece. Uh, you're going to have to know your stuff. You have to get used to the, you know, the corporate climate. And there is a transition there in which if you have a little bit of self-confidence around the difference you can make uh, from being in more entrepreneurial environments, it'll give you, um, you know, what I think is you do need some fiber and tenacity and you need to know your stuff. Those two things. Um, and as long as you're not walking into it, as an innocent that, you know, everyone's going to always want to know exactly what you have to say and, and really care about it as much as you do so that you're not hurt when you get slammed upside the head. Um, because it does happen and there are vested interests. I mean, if, if the uh, powers that be were embracing it, we would have a hybrid car by GM, you know, that was uh, leading rather than following. Um, so I, I think the, the takeaway for me is do where, where your passion calls you. Um, go where you think you can make the biggest impact and, you know, fear nothing. You've talked both a little bit about what, what, what makes you, what you're passionate about, what gets you up in the morning. What, what um, put you to bed early at night besides your kids and other things that these guys won't relate to? What, what puts us to bed? What, what kind of things just are blind, they blindsided you in this space so that maybe they won't blindside these students when they get out there to do what you're doing? Well, I was going to offer this as a corollary to Greg's comment that, you know, I find that the half-life of knowledge is so short now of information that what I hope is happening, and certainly the MBA students who I've spent time with uh, over the last few years, um, I, I, what inspires me is that it's not so much the answers you're getting, it's, the, it's that you're le the, the, the mode of inquiry that you're pursuing, the ability to ask questions. I mean, the, 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 to walk into the environment of 2000, the fall of 2006 is one heck of a lot different than the fall of 2005. Just look at energy prices. Just look at this. The, the, uh, global warming has now got two, you know, new names. It's Katrina. I mean, we're seeing the we're, people are making these connections. Um, what keeps what, what what bums me out is excessive analysis, too much overthinking. So much of what we're talking about here, you know, when I go out and talk to organic farmers in France or in Canada or in the U.S., after I go through my whole song and dance, they just look at me and they say, "Gary, I know what you're saying. You're saying you want me to farm like my grandfather did." Uh, I can do that. You know, all of humanity ate organic food until 1944. I mean, every hero you've got from history, Julius Caesar, Joan of Arc, you know, go through it. it they all were eating organic foods. Um, I agree with Greg. Follow, follow, you know, we're into this testing methodology. Al was talking about that they, by the end of his term, they were pulling every hour. And I say this to Al, and I'll say it to you. I believe that sometimes our best politicians lose because they, 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 they're, try, they, they're trying not to, they're running not to lose as opposed to, to win. They're, they're, they're doing this, and they're asking which way the winds are blowing, and they're doing all the analysis, and they're getting all the editing. And, and, and then by the time they've muted and, 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 and watered down what they're trying to say, uh, I, I don't think you have to be quite so analytical. I think there's an inherent natural gut about what's right out there. And many of you know it. That's why you've invested time this weekend. Uh, so less analysis. Let's talk more do. How about you, Greg? What bummed you out? Um, well, there's an old, I don't know if it's an old saying, but it feels like it should be. Entrepreneurs are like some kind of combination of passion and irritation. And um, I say that because part of, I, I, I know I have the gene, and, you know, and sometimes I think it's unfortunate gene, but um, you're passionate about something. That's one way to, you know, that you you put up with all the lack of resources and, and you put up with, um, you know, what is something ahead of the curve. There's also the irritation, which is you see a world which doesn't have to be that way. And, and it, it's like a, it's a stone in your shoe that you just can't 
can't get rid of until things are a little more ripe. Um, and it started for me because I couldn't get a good glass of orange juice. So, you know, what can you do? <laughs> um, but I think that it, my the image I have um, is you have global climate change on one hand, and this is a vice, so picture the vice, and this is one arm of the vice, and the other vice is human consciousness. And every, everything in between, from a business perspective, is a supply chain. And what's happening is this vice is going like this. And the question is, you know, the, it, it takes an incredible amount of innovation that is looking across all the borders and the boundaries that we used to put all the definitions around, you know, what was a product, what was a service, what was a technology, what, what is, um, you know, marketing, what's branding, um, what what's an ingredient, what... All of these things are being compressed by the reality of how fast we can evolve our perception apparatus, our ability to change. And I kind of close with, you know, so the question is like, you know, what do you do and how do you behave? Um, it, it's such a great question because even though we're a, Adina is a tiny company, we have 10 people. Um, the thing the things that keep me up at night are probably more human relationship. It's like, how do you really keep teams cohesive? How do you really have people be on the same page? How do you really solve problems between each other about how to get along, how to satisfy the needs of both the customer and the people doing the work? And I had an intractable problem, um, and I was a, I was a part of the problem. So um, I asked a good friend who I said, "Who can I call in to just get some some perspective on what you know I just don't understand what is going on, you know, between myself and another senior manager?" And um, he gave me a name to call, and it turns out this guy was um, I think the head of organizational development at Boeing for many years. So this guy. Here I was with a 10-person company, and this guy had just come and left Boeing. I, I don't know how many million. I don't know, maybe in the millions. And he was in charge of the organizational development, the last project for the 777 uh, project. They had uh, over 20 different countries where they had manufacturing plants. All had to come together, and make a product that all of our lives depend upon when we ride in it, and it had to be done on time and under budget. And I said, how did you do this? And he gave me this little pamphlet. And you open the pamphlet, and the first question is, what is the number one job of a leader? And I'm sure, I, you know, I'm sure, I just, I'll pause for a minute, put an answer in your head. And I'll, I'll tell you what this little pamphlet said, and uh, you can make up your mind. Um, but it was to show appreciation. That's now, that's how Boeing is getting it done. I don't know how you're getting it done, but that sounded worth listening to me. So finally I went to sleep. Like the idea of, I like your idea of um, partnering or I guess um, working with Denali and um, being that little maybe stone in their shoe that they start to listen to now. And I know that everything's moving toward organic, but here's the rumor, and I want to know what is true and what goes on with this. I heard that the big food companies, that everybody, you know, they want to get a piece of the organic action, and that there's some sort of lobbying for um, less regulation and actually more expense to get the labels so that in the end it would squeeze out the small people. So. Um, um, what's going on with that, and also how do you do the politics side of business? Uh, what you need to know about the organic food business is that I think we're maybe the only industry I know who has fought for more government regulation. Um, and, uh, and the reason is, is that, uh, as you know, the word natural means nothing now. I mean, there are ice creams that don't change shape when they melt that are called natural, okay? Uh, you, you, you tell me that uh, organic, the seal of organic, which was developed over 12 years in public comment, the most comments in the history of the USDA, over 300,000 public comments came in, farmers, processors, etc., from 1990 to 2000. And two by the time it became law. Uh, recently, a blueberry farmer in Maine, who was actually one of Stonyfield's uh, longtime friends, challenged the, lost, the, the, the regs that were approved by the FDA after this whole um, uh, 
uh, uh, USDA after this whole uh, development process because it allows for 5% synthetics. And they were saying well, that's not consistent with the goal of organic. That should be 100%. Now, synthetic, these synthetics, first of all, there are 38 synthetics that are allowed. I use two of them. One of them is pectin, which comes from apple peel and orange peel. Another is my cultures, which cannot be produced organically. Um, there are other things like baking soda, which last time I checked doesn't grow on trees. Um, these are things that these synthetics are allowed because they cannot be found organically, but they've also been through a rigorous review process by the National Organic Standards Board to say that they are not going to cause, there's no health impact, negative health impact, and they can't be derived um, organically. And every single year, if I use one of these ingredients like pectin, I have to prove every year that I can't find it organically. So what happened, to make a long story short, is that this lawsuit came out, um, and, and basically the, the, the courts ruled in favor of the plaintiff, the blueberry farmer, and said, you know, Congress, you've got to clear, or USDA, you've got to clear this up. You've got to define, is this your intent or not? The USDA injected seven words into the Organic Act to just clarify the intent, which was that if, if not for these uh, this allowance of 5% uh, synthetics, there would be no organics out there. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dairy farmers, thousands and thousands and thousands of bakers would be back to conventional because we wouldn't be able to sell the product as organic and do what I just shared with you. So Congress approved it last week. And, and the folks who are anti have done just what you said. They've gone up and they said, well, this is a big business lobby. You know, these big, horrible companies like Stonyfield and others are, are uh, defending, are, are trying to water down the standards. There was no watering down that happened whatsoever. All it was was a ratification of the very standard that took 12 years and all these hundreds of thousands of comments to create. So I'm glad to blow that out of the water here. I'm not sure that we're going to blow it out of the water for a long time. You know, we progressives have this habit of creating firing squads. You know, you know what a progressive firing squad is, right? You stand in a circle. Uh, like we, we've got to keep our we've got to keep our eyes on the big picture. The big picture here is we've got we have toxified the planet. We have we have we have left future generations with the first, this this generation will be the first one in human history that is not expected to live as long as its parents. And I'm not saying that's my lack of eating organic food. That might be eating you know using too many cell phones or the stress of being MBAs. I don't know what the cause is, but 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 I do know that you can't dismiss organics as part of it. And, and again, the standards could not have had more commentary. So happy to clear it up. Well, uh, what do you think are some of the challenges? challenges of taking some of these ideas to businesses in, in inner cities and implementing them across America or, or other rural areas? I'll take a step that I, I think that um, there's a, uh, a whole frontier on food around local economies um, and solving the last mile of local distribution networks. Um, there's a concept called the food mile. It's how many miles um, it took to a product, so all the ingredients came, and you add that up. And Gary's been a pioneer on looking at the carbon costs of the entire supply chain cycle, all the way up to the finished product. Um, and pioneering and being local entrepreneurs, I think, is as glorious, or you know, should be as ambitious a project on anyone's agenda. And even when you talk about food politics, um, there's a lot of opportunity for creating GM-free um, counties. Um, Sonoma County lost this time, but that was a, a ballot initiative. Um, there are many, many things that all of you can do to try to understand how to help and knit together retailing networks that create um, the possibility for aggregating and achieving economies of scale that corporations have that communities can then, you know, mirror by linking together. Um, here's, here's a brief, very quickly. Uh, a brief response. First of all, we need, we have to, we humans have to live in urban areas. If, if, if right now the planet, if, if all of the world used resources like we use in America, we would need four planet Earths. Cities are by definition more efficient, higher concentrations, uh, more energy efficient, and so on and so forth. And yet, obviously, they're difficult for food production. The, the, the key nugget that I would offer you all as you go out, those of you who may go into consumer products, is, is don't believe what anybody else says. The consumer is still the top of the food chain. When you, when you buy a good, when you run an item past the scanner, 
local you're, you're or voting not, for local or not, or natural or not, <laughs> organic or not. And believe me, and you know this, corporate America spends billions of dollars to tally up those votes. And so, and so the power of finding efficient, I mean, I, I always say to people, what's more important, local or organic? And of course, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is if we could have it on everything in green belts around the cities, we'd obviously have an ecological system. But, but again, keeping our eyes on, 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 the, on the goal, which is taking poisons out of the biosphere, it doesn't matter if we put DDT down in Tierra del Fuego or, or in Palo Alto. It's, once it's in the biosphere, it's in. And so uh, my standard answer to your excellent question, and it, it's hard to give it an abstract with this time, is simply don't forget the power of the consumer to change the nature of the planet. It is what's happening right now. It is why all of these large food companies, all of these large companies are racing there. It's why the, the automotive companies are coming here. So thanks for the question. All right. Thank you.